Good evening. Welcome to The Journey Home. <clears throat> My guest for this evening is Norman Dahlgren. He's a co-author <clears throat> of the book, Jesus, Peter and the Keys, a scriptural handbook on the papacy. It's a book that's had a great impact on many people who have struggled with the issue of the authority of the Pope and his place in the authority in the church. And this book is a compendium of quotes from scripture and quotes from the early fathers that has been a very effective book on defending the Catholic position on the papacy. Norm is with us tonight. I look forward to this time to talk about the issue of Jesus, Peter, and the Keys. That's our theme for tonight. <clears throat> and I want you to remember, of course, that you're an important part of our program. Your questions, both by the phone and email, are uh, the way of challenging Norm on the issues that we'll talk about tonight, but also answering the questions that you might have about the church. So please be prepared to call in your questions at 1-800-221-9460. And if you have a question by email, send it to journeyhome at EWTN.com. Norm, welcome to the Journey Home. It's nice to be here. You know, your book, Jesus, Peter, and the Keys, has been a very effective book uh, addressing this issue of the papacy. And in my work with the Coming Home Network, I've given away dozens of the book for the very purpose of helping people understand what the church really teaches, because isn't often the problem just misunderstanding about the issue of the papacy. People haven't you know, really examined what the church really teaches, and we'll talk about that a little later. But as usual, why don't we begin with having you share a bit of your own spiritual background. Well, where should we begin? <laughs> I'll begin at the beginning. I was born on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, and was <clears throat> baptized as a Lutheran in the old Augustana Synod of the Lutheran Church. And I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, in Mount Prospect, Illinois, where I went to school and went to church at an evangelical Lutheran church, which eventually became part of the American Lutheran Church and all the mergers, all the mergers that took place with the <coughs> Lutheran Church in America, and they became part of what we now have as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I was confirmed as a Lutheran and never felt worthy, never felt worthy in terms of Eucharist or communion, as we would call it. And I was always a little bit hungry, hungry for the truth. And this went on for years and years. And all the way through high school, though, when a lot of people had dropped out of uh, of the church. I stayed in the church and was very happy going to Sunday school. Uh, even through college, I went to church all the way through college. And then after college, I fell away from all faith. And part of it was having read a biography of Luther where I, I noticed that when Melanchthon, which is one of Luther's um, co-workers in the faith, tried to reach an accommodation with Rome and he went back to Wittenberg and Luther said no we can't give anything on this Eucharist I know the truth on the Eucharist and so there there was that chance for rapprochement with the uh, Roman church but it didn't work this biography of Luther kind of set my mind away from all this organized Jesus. religion yeah. And then I spent uh, four years in the Navy. And during that time, it was during the Vietnam War, although I wasn't involved with the, in the action except what, what I say in the peanut gallery offshore, where we <laughs> supplied ammunition to the uh, carriers and destroyers who were engaged in action against the, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. I came away from that with a, an experience of, I, I'm looking for something else. I'm looking for another spiritual way and I was firmly committed to the idea of pacifism and nonviolence and the religious society of friends had a meeting house in La Jolla California and I went there and I was very happy <coughs> being a Quaker for 14 years part of the the group that we would call unprogrammed friends where we met in silence and meditated and waited upon the Lord and engaged in many acts of uh, of charity and and 
really trying to be good people. And there are many wonderful, beautiful people who are Quakers that I still count as friends. At what point, uh, many of the audience may not know a lot about Quakerism, but how did, at what point did it start in the whole Reformation history and how did it start and what's its distinctions compared to the other Protestant movements? It's interesting. It rose uh, essentially during the 1660s. Uh, George Fox in England uh, had it's a about vision. 150 years later than Luther's beginning of his reformation. Correct, yeah. correct. And after the beheadings and after the separation of the English Church from Rome, and after, or pretty much at the same time that Oliver Cromwell came into power in England, George Fox had a had a basically had a revelation on a mountaintop in, in England and uh, basically said that uh, there is another way than the way of the book. Even though Quaker beliefs are based upon biblical Christianity, uh, the, the saying of George Fox would be when someone would say, well, the Bible says, and George Fox would say, but what does thou say? And before the Bible was, God is in the Quaker way of thinking. So there's a real strong emphasis on the personal interpretation as led by the Spirit. A as led by the Spirit and a mystical union yes. with, with, with Christ or with God or as, as Quakers would say, with the light within hmm. or so with that of God that is in every man. So it's almost like a corrective where many of the Protestant movements became so bibliocentric, Bible, almost a legalistic standpoint, you have this other side, very spiritual, mystical, and it's sometimes its own, you know, going off into tangents too. Correct. Side, yeah. During the 1840s, for instance, there was a great revival in the United States, and what arose were uh, meetings that were... Uh, chaired by ministers who were called to the word and they became programmed friends because they had a minister a leader a structure where the in in uh, actually uh, copying to a certain extent the uh, the evangelical hmm. movements of the time and the, as still exists well one day you would eventually come to write a book on the papacy but given your looking back when you were a Quaker at that point, how would you have understood our Pope and the papacy more in general? He, from from the outside, the Pope appeared to be a dictator, appeared to be rather authoritarian, appeared to be out of touch with reality, behind the times. I remember when Paul the Sixth uh, came up with his encyclical on uh, contraception. I had been. At a at a play and was what had was at the, the the it was at the intermission of Galileo by Bertolt Brecht where Galileo was made to recant his uh, cosmic theories. Galileo Galilei has recanted, and that seemed that seemed to put the the Pope the present day Pope at that time Paul the Sixth in, in juxtaposition with. In the way that play presented yeah. Galileo. Absolutely. But it was at the same time that, yeah. that all of a sudden uh, Humana Vitae is released, mm -hmm. which ties with that. Um, given the, your your feelings about the Pope as, uh, did you have a very strong like anti, uh, seeing the Pope as the Antichrist? Was that a part of your understanding of the Pope? Or? Well, that, that certainly... That certainly comes into certain interpretations of Scripture. Let's put it that way. And Martin Luther did refer to the Pope in Rome as the Antichrist, didn't he? So given the combination of your backgrounds, that's a, probably at least a, you know, a fine description. It was a hand-wringing wrench. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, eventually you're going to write a book on the papacy, but what is it that opened your heart then to consider the Catholic Church with you being so deeply involved as a leader of some extent in Quakerism? The, uh, the Catholic Church has, in my mind, never been a terribly polemical church in the sense of going out to attract converts. But everywhere I turned, someone 
with great compassion toward me or toward people around me or toward people that I didn't even know turned out to be Catholic. And it was, it was a very, it was a, in many ways, it was very strange because I, I, I you know how you, you see things or you hear things and you kind of take them and you file them away in, your, in the back of your mind? Well, that was the way it was uh, for me with many of the people that I encountered who were Catholic. And, and yet it was in, and maybe it was in more stark contrast to what, what I had been taught as a Lutheran, how we as Lutherans were so different from Catholics. Now, as a Quaker, we really never engaged in much of that difference between us and them mentality. But in, as, as a Lutheran, we were very close to Catholic uh, belief in terms of our liturgy, um, sacraments, uh, creed, uh, various aspects of worship. And so we were constantly distinguishing ourselves from what it was to be Catholic. And of course, that is not as much that way today with the ecumenical movement, the way it's developed and all. Well, how did you start thinking about actually moving toward the Catholic Church? Very interesting because it was one of those born-again experiences that I had on Good Friday in 1985 when I left work early because I was terribly distraught about my own personal situation. And I went to the only church that was open at that time. And it was the church where my daughter had been baptized because my wife is a cradle Catholic. Uh, but I went into the church and I knelt down in the back of the church and the priest came out and went through the stations of the cross and he spoke, to use a Quaker's term, he spoke to my mind, he spoke to my heart. And I was, I was slain by, I think, the Holy Spirit. And I went home and said to my wife, I said, well, I don't care what happens. I've given it up to Jesus. And she said, what? <laughs> <laughs> that was in category she's used to speaking in, right? That's, <laughs> that's a category she's used to speaking in because after oh, okay. my conversion, she would say, oh, I knew this would happen. Your mother and father are going to blame me for this, and I didn't have anything to do with it. I told you, you shouldn't become Catholic. God save us from the converts. So did, did you come in immediately after that uh, Took powerful about experience? three years. Why three years? I had to study. I had to find out whether what my feelings were were correct. And then uh, my business partner at the time uh, was considering becoming Catholic and his parents said to me, Norm, why don't you become Catholic? And I said, no, I can't do that. And I, at the meantime, I was studying out of the catechism and I had also taught some CCD classes for my wife who didn't like being in front of a bunch of fifth graders. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And so I went to the bookstore and picked up a catechism, just pulled it off the shelf and it just happened to be John Harden's book. On the great, it's a great catechism. Yeah. Turned out to be a very good book, and so that kind of introduced me to the faith. Uh, plus, when I met Bishop Maher in in San Diego, uh, Sister Ruth introduced me as our, our Quaker CCD teacher. Ah, <laughs> oh, and Bishop says, "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to meet you. Good to meet you." <laughs> didn't think twice about the fact you were a Quaker teaching in the Catholic he, did, he didn't miss a step. He didn't miss a step. So, so you, you struggled with all the issues, and uh, any particular one jumped out at you that was a, a barrier? That the usual. The usual. Mary. Hmm. Mary, the mother of God. Is she, she's really the mother of God? And you pray to her? And the Pope this wizened old man in Rome whom some have said is the Antichrist or the whore of Babylon even though he sits on a hill across from the seven hills that were spoken of in Revelation 18 but I didn't find that out until many years later yeah. so you dealt with those now given your background as a Lutheran mm -hmm. and all that Luther taught about uh, the Pope and I was brought up in the 
essentially the same branch of Lutheranism that you were, I think. I, and so we went through the similar confirmation classes and had all of the certain view of the papacy uh, implanted in us. And then given your years, almost equal number of years as a Quaker, which is such a different kind of Christian faith in many ways. You know, I, I didn't think of talking to you about how Quakers understood Mary. Uh, I don't know if they talked much about Mary. The subject never came up. Yeah, interesting. Never came up. Um, given that background, <clears throat> how now do you understand the papacy? Describe a little bit of your understanding as a Catholic of our Pope and the papacy, maybe in light of your background. Well, the Pope to me today is a father figure, little Papa, the, the father. And more importantly, as he fulfills the 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 what scripture says he should fulfill the role he said that scripture says he should fulfill and that is to be a shepherd to the flock feed feed my sheep tend my lambs feed my sheep um, what about those that say you're not supposed to call him buddy father and pope is papa did you ever call your father father? Well, I know that. But call no man father? That's what the scripture Call says. no man leader? Call no man president? Yeah. Some, I mean, it's got to call him something, right? And if, it's in, and if you feel an endearment toward that person, you're going to call them father. Yeah. And I think it's amazing on how that understanding of the Pope, even though his name is Papa, it's father, is that so many outside the church don't realize that's really how we understand the Pope. But there's also a confusion about his authority. Our Pope today is more visible maybe than any other Pope in the history of the church, but still people misunderstand his authority. How do you understand his, how would you describe the authority of the Pope? The Pope is our leader, the leader of the church, and when he speaks, or when the magisterium speaks, or when the bishops together with the Pope speak, they speak with the authority of those who are there to safeguard our faith and morals. To set standards for morals, to set forth the parameters of our faith. Not this, this is, this is how you have to believe because we all have a choice of whether to do or not to what our Father asks us to do. But, the Pope, together with the bishops, set our standards for us. It was interesting, earlier we were talking about some changes that the Quakers have made in their understanding of certain moral issues. And I thought that was an interesting comparison, I don't know if you want to talk about it, between how we as Catholics address the, the issue versus how, let's say, we want to pick on a denomination, but how the Quakers come up with an answer and how the people in the pew are to understand moral issues. Yeah, and and the 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 way in which uh, Quakers come to decisions is is through a very uh, consensual process of trying to find unity in the decisions that are made, and on several moral issues that that would be at variance with the Catholic Church, Quakers have tended to come up with differing views on the on the whole subject uh, and I remember abortion being something that was uh, debated or discussed be in, in light of our peace testimony in light of not wanting to take human life whether they be enemy or friend innocent or not innocent regard to war and capital punishment and how that attitude has not made the transference to abortion which has become an issue that is up to the individual and in some cases for instance with the Friends Committee on Legislation in California they lobby for a woman's unrestricted right to choose abortion that's just one issue and that's an example of the, the problem of democratic theology or it's interesting that the ideal of coming to consensus, you know, may have some value in that. But imagine picking every little issue of theology and deciding 
the way we decide what's true is whether the three of us or the ten of us or the hundred of us can agree on it. Well, the fallacy in that came to the fore, I think, early on in the Reformation when Luther said, well, whoa, whoa, wait a second on this personal interpretation of Scripture. When the peasants took it into their own hands to do away with some of the some of the bonds that were holding them to the land, and the peasants' revolt in Germany was was severely um, castigated by by Luther. Yeah. This is not what I had in mind. <laughs> so. Wait a second, that's right. With, again, given our backgrounds, Lutheranism, and also your background in, in Quakerism, let's, how does the Pope? receive his authority how does this man get put in a position and again I'm going to ask this question so you can help those in the audience that wonder how does the Pope get this authority that he wields how does the Pope get his authority well the simple answer would be that he was elected by a conclave of cardinals to be Pope to, and they you know, they laid essentially laid hands on him, anointed him with the charism of being Pope, of being the leader of the, of the Catholic faithful. Well, where did they get their authority to give him the authority? They are apostolic successors to the original apostles. And that apostolic succession goes right back to Jesus Christ, right back to the beginning right back to the appointment of the twelve and the twelve appointing those to succeed them as uh, Clement uh, one of the first popes said in one of his, his letter to the Corinthians mm -hmm. the end of the first century this idea of, of the importance of who sent you is where the authority comes from it's not I feel the Lord calling me into leadership okay I've been sent no 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 it's the people who have the authority that have received from those that had authority declare you have, a, you have the authority and therefore you are uh, the man to lead us. And Very interesting because what you, what you just prompted in my mind was something we hadn't even talked about. I mean, before we discussed some of these issues, but we hadn't even talked about uh, Paul being knocked off his horse by the light and Jesus... Christ apostle saying Paul, right. yeah. the Apostle Paul, yeah. Saint Paul, right. well, being unhorsed and being told by Jesus Christ, why do you persecute me? Paul got up right away, went into Damascus and said, I'm one of you. And they all shied away <laughs> thinking this man is unhinged because he has been our persecutor. He's been the cause of, our, of the death of people like Saint Stephen. And yet, Paul felt that call, but he didn't go forth until he was anointed, until hands were laid upon him to go forth and preach. By the other apostles. By, by the, the other by apostles. The well, that's right. Uh, one attack that is often uh, posed at the church in the issue of the papacy is, what about all those bad popes? You know, how can this be the church? And they would list off a name of bad pope. What do we do with bad popes? During my conversion process, I was listening to a, a sermon by a very boring priest. I don't know if we've ever known any boring priests before who were not terribly good homilists. But this was one. And, and uh, Father Joseph has now passed on, but I was in a, a state of semi-torpor uh, <laughs> at Mass one day with my wife, and he was saying, you know, we've had bad popes, God knows. And I was sitting back there and going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I know that. We've had bad priests, God knows. Mm-hmm, I know that. And I was, you know, starting to agree with him. Start, almost gave him an amen. <laughs> and what he did then was he said, that's not the point. The point is that this is the church of Jesus Christ, established by Jesus Christ and carried on by 
the successors to Peter and the apostles from then until now. That's the point. And I was struck between the eyes because that had never been the point to me. The church was an amorphous spiritual being. It was not a visible manifestation of who Jesus Christ is. The other uh, critique that I've heard is I'm not having any Pope tell me what to do in my life. You know, as if seeing our relationship with our Papa as one of slavery. You know, talk about personally as a Catholic. Your oh, are you talking about Pope. Catholics or non-Catholics when you well, speak about Well, I don't know. That. There might have been a few Catholics that said that. Maybe ones that have gone the other direction. But I'm thinking particularly those outside the church that have said, I'm not going to become Catholic because I'm not some Pope run my life. Talk about your relationship personally. Well, that's interesting. I don't have a personal relationship with the Pope. He's never called me. <laughs> He's never written me a letter. I, I, you know, I just haven't. I don't have a personal relationship with him, but I have a personal relationship with my parish priest. I have a, I have a nodding acquaintance with the bishop. Uh, and so, those are my sources of authority, and their authority comes through the magisterium through the, the Holy See, through the Pope. And they are, essentially the bishops are co-bishops with the Pope in many in many respects. And, and they are their own popes in their own diocese. And that's an interesting relationship to have because it's, it's the relationship that I would have with, with uh, uh, someone who is a leader but who is not visibly present to me all the time. And it's not the Pope himself who does this, these pronouncements. The Pope is a reflection of the whole line of Popes and Bishops that have gone before him back to Jesus Christ. And when this Pope, John Paul II, has written some of his encyclicals, some have told me that he does it on his knees before the Blessed Sacrament. This is a ma not a man who is going to just uh, say, I am in charge here. You do what I tell you to do. Or, he's, he or speaks say, from authority. Or say, oh, guys, tell me what's the public opinion out there. Or what would be the most popular thing to do to make sure I can have another four years in this position. Uh, what he's saying is what is true. Or, or also, not just what's true, but what is to be preserved? What is to be proclaimed? You know, what, has been, what have we received from the beginning that we are to then apply today and pass on? You know, I, I was thinking again of that verse about sent. You were just describing, in a sense, you know, our local priest is a kind of a pope in the sense that he's our papa, but he's also under authority because we have this long line of being sent. And I, I'm referring to this passage in Romans 10 that I want the audience to know where it comes from. Romans 10, 14, very important passage because... People will emphasize in this passage the call to go out and evangelize, the call to preach. Because it says, How are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? You know, that sounds well and good. So people go out and preach, and God's called me to preach. And so they have their own authority to go preach. I heard this in a vision. I'm going to go preach. And how are they going to know unless I'm out there preaching? But they skip the next line, which says, And how can men preach unless they are sent? And that is written in the context of the church and the authority of the apostles. You know, that is, and when you talked about priest and bishop and the magisterium and mm -hmm. the pope, and the, I mean, it's a long line of men being ordained, being sent forth in the authority that they receive from Christ. We have, our authority comes from the Word of God. And we look upon the Word of God as being the book, the scripture, and the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. And we being the most democratic of all churches, give a vote to the dead because we believe in tradition, sacred tradition, not little t, but big t tradition. That is the tradition of the faith of the fathers as they were first called. As they said to the early Christians, hold on to that which you received in the beginning. That's the church. That's its responsibility. And during the break, there'll be some information for the audience in case they want to 
find out about your book, Jesus, Peter, and Keys, really briefly before we take a break, how did you ever find yourself writing a book about the papacy? God knows that. <laughs> we started to write a Bible study, a Bible study using my old King James version of the Bible and going through various uh, aspects of the faith, justification, the papacy being one of them, and the most difficult. As Scott Butler said, this is the most difficult one. Let's tackle this one first. We were going to write a book on, actually, we were going to do a Bible study on each one of them. But Dave Hess and Scott Butler and I decided to concentrate on the papacy, and we decided to use the King James Version of the Bible, including the Apocrypha, which was part of the King James Version of the Bible, originally until... 1639 or 1644, depending on whether you listen to Mitch Pacwa or me. <laughs> so that that is how it, that's that's how it got started. It got started as a Bible study. What are the most what are the most used and abused questions about the papacy, and how do we answer them? And how do we answer them in the words of Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox theologians? Well, it's a very helpful book, and the audience. We'll see during the break information and if they'd like to find out more information about the book. So why don't you please stay with us. We'll be back for your questions to Norman Dahlgren about the issue of Jesus, Peter, and the Keys. Welcome back to Journey Home. My guest this evening, Norman Dahlgren, is the co-author of a book, Jesus, Peter, and the Keys, and that's what we've chosen for our theme tonight, uh, the issue of the papacy, and you've talked a little bit about it as a result of your own journey from Lutheranism through Quakerism into the church. Um, and we've, let's take our first email. This is a big, long one with a mess of questions in it. I'm not sure we'll get to all these questions, but at least try and answer one of them. Okay. Um, this comes from David. Dear Marcus and Norman, some say that when Jesus said to Peter, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, that Jesus meant he himself was the rock and not Peter. Catholics say that the term Petra applies to Peter. Uh, then he goes on, Do you know how the passages read in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek? Also in Jerusalem, James, not Peter, had the role as bishop. Do you have any evidence that Peter was ever in Rome? Do you know of any books and or websites that can help me answer these questions? I look forward to hearing your answers. Those are good questions by David and, and common questions. Let's do the first one, okay. which was? The first one was um, the word Petra. When Jesus says the word Petra, who is he referring to? When Jesus uses the word Petra in, and let's read, the, let's read Matthew, Matthew 16, 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Many have said that, or have tried to say, or have believed that Jesus was referring to himself as the rock, or to Peter's faith as the rock. However, if you turn back or turn forward to John 1.42, let's look at John 1.42 for a second. In John 1.42, Jesus is speaking, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. This is according to the King James Version. But if you look at the Greek, it says... It okay. talks about Petra. So here he's specifically okay. saying that Simon is being called Petra. And Kepha in Aramaic means rock. 
And so you're using the term, you are, you are rock and upon you I will build my church. Basically, uh, you are rock and upon you, Rocky, I will build my church because Peter is just a chip off the old block. <laughs> John Paul II refers to Jesus Christ as the rock of the church. And we believe that. But we also believe that Peter was endowed with certain, uh, a certain charism to lead the church. And he was therefore called rock. Just as Abraham was called rock by God back in the Old Testament to lead the people Israel. I've got an interesting quote here from the book, and I love this quote because we happened upon it. It, just, it wasn't in any reference work. We just were going through the works of Calvin. And Calvin basically said, while not conceding that Peter was the rock to whom Jesus spoke in Matthew 16, he said, quote, I grant that in Greek, Peter, Petros, and stone, Petra, mean the same thing, save that the first word is Attic, that is from the ancient classical Greek dialect of the Attica region, the second from the common tongue. So there's John Calvin saying that about rock. And if he had wanted Peter to be just a little pebble or stone, he would have, u would have used the Greek word lithos, lithos. instead of, instead of uh, yeah. Petra. Many make that critique about the two Petros. Greek uses of the word Petros and Petra, when in reality, if you get down to the Aramaic, Kepha and there's Kepha. Only, there's only one word for either. So one both, word for either in both and, places. Isn't and in and in the we also uh, ran across. Well, how was this distinguished? Calvin uh, distinguished it to a certain extent, even though he didn't see any real way to distinguish them. And Petros and Petra were used in some uh, ancient Greek poetry, not at the time that the New Testament was written, but in some ancient Greek poetry, as distinguishing one from the other. But essentially, they're the same. Another part of David's question had to do with the fact that James, as opposed to Peter, had the role of bishop in Jerusalem. Does that cause a problem with, with Peter's call to leadership of the apostles? Well, Peter's call to leadership of the apostles. James was the bishop of Jerusalem, and James was the host bishop, if you will, for the prototype of the first ecumenical council. And so, yes, James was there, but if you look at what was said at that council in Jerusalem, Peter's vision in Acts 10 was acted out in Acts 15. What Peter said was what the council decided upon. That's right. When he spoke, his, yeah. the, the council took his word uh, let's, go, let, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to what the council was all about. The council had to do with the Judaizers, the Judaizers and the Gentiles. Those who were Jews and wanted those who came into the faith being converted to Judaism before they became Christians. And those Gentiles who were coming into the faith being welcomed into the Catholic faith by Peter and the other apostles without having to go through the Judaizing first. And yet, these Noachide, the Noachide covenant that was uh, incumbent upon all people of all ages, even Jews today say, why do you want to become a Jew when you just need to follow the Noachide covenant, which is having, having to do with keeping the moral law and, and not eating certain certain uh, uh, meats that still have the blood in them and, and the other uh, elements of what it means to be kosher. So, well, it is interesting to see that in that case, here you do have James as the leader of this of the Jerusalem church, and yet when the decision is made, uh, the roving missionary evangelist, Peter, is the one that speaks the word that everyone says Peter has spoken. Let's take our first caller tonight. This is Maureen from New Jersey. Hello, Maureen. What's your question for us tonight? Just why? Um, I was wondering if you could explain to me the um, the infallibility, the doctrine of infallibility of the Pope and when they came about and how it's justified. Thank you, Maureen. Question. The infallibility of, of the, the Pope. Pope. What does it mean? How was it defined? When was it defined? 
what does it mean? Well, the infallibility of the, of the Pope as, as to what it means and when it, takes, when it uh, occurs is, is done under some very specific conditions, and I would like to, to just refer to those here. Um, the infallibility of the Roman pontiff as the head of the College of Bishops enjoys in virtue of his office when as the supreme shepherd and teacher of all the faithful who confirms his brethren in their faith by a definitive act proclaims a doctrine of faith or morals speaking to faith and morals that's in that's when the pope or the college of cardinals or the, or the college of bishops and the pope speak together as to a, a matter of faith and morals now, impeccability, the Pope is a sinner just like you and me. Goes to confession. Goes to confession regularly. A sinner in need of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many have tried to make infallibility into impeccability. How can he speak and say the things he's saying when he's just a plain old sinner. But he's not just a plain old sinner because it's, it's the, the virtue, the charism is in the office, in the role, in the position of Pope. That's what's significant about infallibility. Impeccability, sinlessness, none of us, none of us is sinless, save for Jesus Christ and his mother Mary. Part of the question was also the issue of defining a doctrine. Talk a little bit about that from a Catholic perspective. I mean, was it invented in the in the mid nineteenth century, or uh, you know, how did the doctrine of the church come about, especially that one? Well, certainly, what happens in the church, and this is this is um, somewhat of a game. The word becomes defined perhaps far later than when it was actually put into practice. It was a concept in need of a definition. And that definition came in the mid-1850s, or in the, the end of the 1850s, 1859, 60, the Vatican I. Wasn't it Vatican right. I? Right. The, the whole concept of Peter teaching infallibly, though, you can see the, the foundation for it in Scripture. And if I may, going back to uh, Matthew 16. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Fine, we've, built, we've got a church. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the authority to make halakhic pronouncements. As if he were a rabbi speaking in interpretation of scripture and interpretation of the Talmud. Binding and loosing faith and morals, jurisdiction and practice, all of the things that, that go into a, an encyclical or whatever comes from the mouth of the Pope in an infallible way? Perhaps. In, uh, um, not in an infallible way? Perhaps. But when it says whatever thou shalt bind and loose, that has that has a heavenly proportion to it because in the Greek as I understand it the word has to do the words have to do with whatever shall have been already bound in heaven so God is is sanctifying God is putting his imprimatur his seal of approval on what Peter proclaims, on what he binds and looses. 
and and that's the basis for it, and we can go in and, and develop that in, in even greater detail. And it certainly, the use of this power by the Pope developed over a period of years, but you can find the basis right, for it early on. Let's take our next email then. This comes from Ron Talley. So, greetings. I have a friend who is a Quaker. He seemed to avoid any talk of theology altogether. Can you explain, please, the theology of Quakerism? I understand it will be necessarily a brief summary. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here's in Jesus Christ. Well, there is no theology of Quakerism. Howard Brinton, years ago, wrote a book called The Religious Philosophy of Quakerism, which he based uh, in a large part on the Gospel of John and upon the development of the concept of the light within and that of God within each man. Quakers uh, will not they have be no known to have a creed, mm -hmm. no creed, no sacraments per se, although there is a welcoming into the assembly. There are no rites of initiation per se. So um, the theology of Quakerism is... Uh, it's there, I think, if you wanted to sit down and write it, but as any Quaker would say, each Quaker develops his or her own theology within himself, within herself, as the light and the, and the presence of God within moves them. It's actually amazing when you look at the... look at history to see how that kind of understanding of the Christian faith could develop given what had preceded that for 1,500, 1,600 years. But they get to the point of basically believing that every individual has the total freedom to decide, given their understanding of the Spirit, what is true. Yes, but also given that they are operating within the auspices of the, of the monthly meeting and coming to consensus on many decisions. And you must, you must remember, too, the program friends, those who have ministers, will be much more into the Word of God directly, into the Bible directly, um, where the unprogrammed friends are not, are not beholden to Scripture, but are often inspired, inspired to, uh, to meditate in terms of it. Let's take our next caller. This is Tim from Ohio. Hello, Tim. What's your question for us tonight? Yeah, uh, in defending the faith, I find myself regularly engaged in um, trying to defend the faith with uh, separated Christian brothers and sisters. What would be a good strategy or strategies in trying to get them to acknowledge or uh, research the writings of the early church fathers as far as uh, acknowledging the authority of the Bishop of Rome and the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist and so forth? Thank you, Tim. How do you get them to see the authority of the early fathers and get them to read it? Read this book. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Mitch Pacwa said. Read did, this book. Did you set Tim up in Ohio? <laughs> no, I didn't set Tim up in Ohio, but we have to remember that the first step to conversion, in my mind, is just as uh, the, uh, the so-called prodigal son coming back to the father. We have to love that person. We have to love Jesus, and we have to love the people that we're speaking with, and in a way, we have to teach them to appreciate history. Because if you believe that this is the inspired Word of God, so we have to start with that basis. Is this the inspired Word of God? And has Christianity existed since the beginning? Or let's at least get them to start with the Bible and then proceed from the biblical era forward. It's, I was thinking that one of the things that convinced me about the authority of the early church fathers was, was recognizing first that part of my background in evangelicalism had assumed that sometime very early in the church everything got off base. Okay, that was that presumption. That, and we had to keep pushing it back farther and farther. Well, the, the value of the early fathers isn't this true, is that they're the ones that were at the very feet of the apostles themselves. So for them to get off base when they learned it from the apostles or they learned it from a person who learned it from apostles, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that they would get it so wrong so quickly. 
listening to the apostles. So that's the value of the fathers. Encourage your friends to recognize that. These are the men's in their very, they might not know, in fact, that there are writings that we have from the people who learned it from the apostles. Because many non Catholics just don't know that. Let's take our next email. It says, Gentlemen, many people claim the Pope has no business commenting on issues, issues such as birth control and feel they can follow their conscience in such matters and remain good Catholics. What do the Bible and the fathers of the church say about obedience? despite disagreement. Well, let's look to uh, Romans. Let's go to Romans. Romans uh, 1, 5. I can't find it. There we go. Romans 1, 5. And this was something that I thank uh, Scott Hahn for. And that is pointing out that Romans is really about the church of Rome because early on verse 5 Paul says well I'll start with verse 4 and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith obedience to the faith among all nations for his namesake. Essentially, we must be obedient to the faith. Then, if we look to see, well, what is the pillar and ground of truth? I've asked that question to many of my friends, and they say, Jesus Christ? Uh, the Bible? Well, let's, let's see if we can find what the pillar and ground of truth is. is Second First Timothy, Timothy? Second Tim, or 1 Timothy. Yeah, it's 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3.15. Because the verse that we want you audience to, to memorize is a very important verse here as we, as we draw down in our time here tonight at the end of the program. 1 Timothy 3.15. These things, well, let's start with 14 again. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. If you want to know where the truth is, look to the church, the church that gave us the New Testament. And a lot of people will argue with that, but the, the Bible New Testament didn't just plunk itself at our feet. The apostles taught it, and the bishops selected it. Ooh. Which of the books? Because even yeah, many, of those, of, the letters, books. many mm -hmm. of those letters of the early fathers at one point in time were thought to be a part of the scriptures. First and Second Corinthians, where the where it, where the apostolic succession was laid out by Clement, was one of those was two of those books that were dropped from the final canon. Norm, I appreciate your witness, uh, both in your in your journey, but also in the book that you've written about the papacy, and maybe in a, maybe in a minute summary as we close up. Let me ask you the question: How coming into the Catholic Church has drawn you closer to Jesus? Thirty, forty seconds. What would you say how it's helped you draw closer to Jesus Christ? Drawing closer to Jesus by emphasizing prayer, penance, and I wish I could fast more. <laughs> that has drawn that has brought me closer to Jesus knowing that his mother is there to pray for me and the saints are there a whole cloud of witnesses are there before me and are there rooting me and you on to faithfulness that's one of the reasons I think that you had chosen to, to become a lay Carmelite right that area of prayer and, and uh, commitment and surrender and, and meditation and a mystical relationship is something that came from Quakerism to me and now is a part of my Catholic faith as well. Norm, thank you very much for being a part of the journey home. It's a joy to be with you and I encourage the audience to consider your book, especially if they have questions about the, the papacy. Thank you again for being with us. I always enjoy being with you on the journey home. I look forward to joining you next week. And remember, let's keep each other in prayer because we walk on the journey together. 
God bless.